Our first speaker is uh, Matthew Collins. Professor Matthew Collins holds a uh, Niels Bohr chair at the Staten's, uh, now we're getting into Danish, uh, Natur Historiska Museum, <laughs> Copenhagen, and the McDonald chair, I can do that, of paleoproteomics at the University of Cambridge. His research explores the processes by which proteins undergo decay and how we can exploit new paleoproteomics methods in the service of paleontology, archaeology, and cultural heritage. Matthew notes that he has stumbled through his career with the unwavering focus of a drunken goldfish, taking a lectureship in biogeochemistry at the University of Newcastle. He there became more interested in archaeology and so set up the BioArc Laboratory, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research center in biology, archaeology, and chemistry at the University of York. Two years ago, he joined the Tom Gilbert's Evogenomics Group at the Natural History Museum in Copenhagen, where he is establishing a research group in the developing field of paleoproteomics. He has now taken a 40% McDonald chair in this eponymous subject at the University of Cambridge, commuting between there and Copenhagen. He spends a lot of time in airports where fittingly this biography was written. <laughs> So his topic today is of skins and ships and sealing wax of cabbages and kings, life frozen in the archives. Please join me in welcoming Matthew. Thanks very much. Well, it's a huge place to be here. It's slightly uh, overwhelming, actually. It's an just incredible range of disciplines have been discussed. And I want to talk about another material. We haven't heard much about this material before, and this is parchment. This is the skins of dead animals. And I've really been kind of working very hard to try and explain how I want to situate my own research. And I really have not been able to articulate it very well. But I was on the website of this fine institution and I read this. I just think this is absolutely how I feel about this. The idea that once you take an object as a starting point, you don't think about which discipline you're coming from. You don't think about the kind of conventional way in which being trained to view these objects, by taking the object as a starting point, you just open up a whole series of new possibilities um, of understanding the life of that object. And that's why I'm going to say that we have this incredible record of life in the, in the archives. And it comes about um, because I've been interested in trying to recover information about animal mortality patterns using bones as an archaeologist, and then appreciating that you actually can begin to see the same kinds of information in the skins of animals found in documents. And it's not a new idea, it's been an idea that's been around for some time, so a number of researchers have begun to think about the book object as an archaeological object. They begin to study the book object as a living thing, the pathology of books. So it's not an, a particularly novel idea, but I think what's happened is that there's just been an incredible explosion of potential. And what I've been able to do is nothing more than chat to a bunch of very smart young people. Um, so I'm not so young, in the case of Erigi, um, uh, but they, who have all got different backgrounds in genomics and proteomics, in, in book binding, in conservation, in veterinary medicine, um, in, in um, analytical tools. And, and I've just convinced them all that we should all work together around this project. And we've been very fortunate to just have been funded with an ERC project called Beasts to Craft, which is looking at these questions of the life of parchment. And so the work I'm going to talk about is not mine, and their pictures will appear indicating who did what, when, and where. And the, the reality of the, ex, the potential has come about on the back, really, of personalized medicine and the technologies that have been driving that, both in genomics and proteomics. And this, this graph down the base here is just showing you the massive increase, oh, I can't get right to work, um, the massive increase in numbers of geno genomes that have been published over the, the past years. And these are genomes of people that died thousands of years ago. These are ancient genomes. The fact that we can recover ancient genomic data is utterly transforming archaeology. And we, working in the world of proteins, are sort of, you know, a number of steps behind, but rapidly catching up. And the curious thing for us, working these disciplines, is the technology which has been developed is designed to work on small, fragmented molecules. And, of course, that's what we look at. We look at damaged old molecules. And so I'm going to talk about this in terms of 
essentially the story of parchment production and the, and the ways which we can use these technologies to begin to think about that. So it's production, it's use, it's handling, and I'm not really going to touch on, I'll leave it as a final slide, what does this mean for conservation? Um, and I'm going to take you to this particular thesis, a marvellous thesis, from a master's student in 1954, okay? which we have scanned and digitised and we all consult, because Saxel was interested and aware of the process of parchment manufacture, and she visited one of the very few parchment manufacturers that was left. Because, um, and what I'm going to do is basically, this is three pages of her thesis, and I want to walk you through the kinds of information, the kind of understanding about how we can prepare this material, that we can learn from the clues left behind in the material object. So the first thing that she says is that parchment is made from sheepskin. It's come from, salted from the slaughterhouse. And we can ask questions about, well, is she right? Is it actually made of sheep? Is it made of something else? What about the age of the animals? As a zooarchaeologist, what is the sex of the animals? What are the mortality profiles? And can we say something about the health of the animals? Are all these things that are accessible from the material culture we're looking at? And so what we've been doing with Sarah has developed this, and many of you know Sarah Filament, is she has come up with a way of extracting the collagen and DNA from dry eraser waste, effectively. So waste from parchment conservation. And she'll send you a kit if you're interested, and if you just send the waste from this eraser treatment, um, she will analyze it for you. Um, and if you give you if you give a small amount, we can do proteins. And if you give us a larger amount in the tube, these are small Eppendorf tubes, we can also now, as you've been doing this with Matthew Teasdale, uh, extract for DNA as well. So this is a we are essentially using the waste from conservation treatment. So it is destructive because we're obviously taking materials off the surface, but we're doing it hopefully in, in the aid of conservation. So the question then is, what is that species? It says here it's sheep. Is it really sheep? Now what Sarah's been able to do because of the, 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 the very generous collaboration of many people in the room here is actually analyze a whole series of parchment documents in excess of 5,000 now. But as many of you know, not all those have got their provenance. So these are the ones we have reasonably good provenance for. And the ones that float in the middle of nowhere, we're not quite sure where they're from. But what you'll see here is that in Spain and in England, sheep are very dominant. In France, Germany, and as we move into Scandinavia, it's much more cattle dominated. And Italy is really intriguing because you have both goat and sheep. Sheep are also, so goats are also found in, more in southern France. So we're going to see a pattern of the use of the skins, which really mirrors what we know about the production of animals in, um, in medieval Europe. And one of the curious things about Britain is we see an awful lot of sheepskin. And we found now that 99.95%, because we've analyzed many of them, of legal documents in Britain are on sheepskin. We don't know really why this is, but it could come back to this, this um, recommendation um, in the past that you should use sheepskin for legal documents because you can't erase them readily and because otherwise the, uh, uh, the evidence is, is there because what these skins do because of the presence of a very uh, strong layer of fat in the center, they delaminate, they separate. So maybe that's why sheepskin is being used. I don't know because in modern sheepskin, <laughs> modern being from the 17th century, it was made so well that actually you could have happily raised it just like goatskin or calfskin, but it was always sheepskin. And of course, it, it matters to know what, what the, the book is made of. I mean, this is the text, Codex Amiatinus, very famous text, made from, from 5,000 calves and some very elegant scholarship looking at uh, the way that Bishop Colfrick, the amount of land he had to buy to raise these cattle in Northumberland to make this text. And so it's a, it's a great bit of scholarship. Unfortunately, it's got to be wrong because they're not made of cows at all. It's made of goat. And it's actually probably made, almost certainly made of Italian goat. It's actually made of poxy Italian goat. So it probably comes from a herd. So, you know, that, but actually looking at the skin, um, you actually have a, a whole different sense of the origin of this production of this book. Because this is a book which is made in Northumberland and actually taken to the Pope and ends up in F Florence. Um, and there's two other Pandek Bibles made at the same time. Both of those have got much reference of calfskin and both of them say it's in Britain. Is there something about the nature of the material choice here and the fact that this was the pandemic that was taken back to Italy? So understanding the species matters. And the other curious thing about this as well is that this is a line of evidence which has not really been exploited by archaeologists. So here we see a plot of the, the, the proportions of young to elderly animals in different periods of medieval England. 
And you'll notice that quite strikingly that in Norman England, we have no juvenile animals. And yet we see thousands upon thousands of calf skin document. So how does that work? There's a complete, there's a complete um, problem, a challenge. And the same thing has been noticed with Doomsday, because again, Doomsday talks about a very high preponderance of sheep to calf, and yet the animal bone assemblages in archaeology are saying something different. So parchment is a new source of information that can be used by archaeologists to understand animal practice. And we can also analyze things like the dietary isotopes. And so this is data we simply do not understand. This is measuring what the sheep are eating, and this is plotted against the date of the document. And you can see this uptick in the middle of the 19th century. I suspect this probably could be the introduction of Indian corn. It, it, these animals are feeding partly on maize, which is a C4 plant, and that causes a shift in the the carbon stable isotope values. But I have no idea why this is. This is just data that's just fallen out of the routine analysis that we've been conducting. Um, maybe it's corn for sheep. I mean, you know, we're just trying to sort of make sense of the data at the moment. We have no idea why. We need to get better work with economic historians to understand how much corn is coming out. I don't think there's enough corn coming in to the UK to make that answer. And then the animals themselves. Um, what sex are the animals? Because it's important to know the mortality patterns. This is a, a late, late Anglo-Saxon Bible, and it's been made of female calves. It seems an extraordinary thing to choose female animals to make your document from, because you'd have thought that those are the animals you want to, to raise the herd. You have one bull, m m m many, many female, female animals. So why is this? Why are they chosen female animals? And it gets worse because this is probably produced in about 990. In 987, there's a major moraine in this part of the world which kills most of the cattle. So you surely won't want to re-establish the, the, the herds. What is going on here? So understanding the, the choice, and one argument is by Martin Carver, who's an Anglo-Saxon specialist, this is just conspicuous consumption. You're using the absolute best materials to make this, which is an incredibly important text. This is the York Gospels. This is the book that gets taken to York by Archbishop Wolfstan, a very important book. So perhaps they're just using the best possible materials for the text. Um, what about other things? So another thing we've noticed when you go to a parchment manufacturer, manufacturing site is these piles of parchment. And you can see the formation of halophilic bacteria on the surface of them. But the price, that means we're using a lot of salt. A huge amount of salt is used to salt skins. But salt was not cheap in Northern Europe. So can we understand the relationship between the way that parchment is being made and the distances that parchment is moving and other economic drivers like the price of salt? Um, Okay, so we've looked at age, we've looked at sex, we've looked at species. Now the next thing we see in the parchment manufacturing process is that the wool puller sorts the wool. So he's taking the wool out of the, out of the parchment because they're gonna sell the wool on. So what is the relationship between the skins that are being used for the parchment and the wool that the sheep are being raised for? Remember, the wealth of England, according to the barons, um, is in the wool on the sheep's back. And, of course, the problem now with understanding what was going on at those times, as Eileen Power points out, is that the, the desire to improve breeds at the end of the 18th century has really wiped out all the varietal types that we probably had previously. And we know we had those previously because look at the pricing of wool. We can see that certain parts of the country, say the Welsh marches around Hereford, the price is always staying very high. That's the so-called Leinster ore the Queen Elizabeth makes her stockings from. Uh, or other parts of the country, are, there's no documentation there's any wool being brought from them because the wool is of such poor quality. And what's extraordinary about this is can we look at the parchment and see in the parchment the follicle patterns and see in those follicle patterns the quality of the fleeces? So can we match together the, the data we have from the quality of parchment. So this is where I was really intrigued um, to hear about this work on imaging and the way that we may be using imaging and crowdsourcing to potentially image the follicle patterns. So for instance, you know, do two, two parts of indenture come from the same animal looking, about, but for us it's really about can we start to see varietal type coming out in the parchment showing regional signals which we can use instead of using more complex and expensive genetic analysis. And so what I've been doing for that is I've been buying parts on eBay. Everyone's been on eBay buying artifacts. So if you go to our website, the Beatscraft website, you'll see this collection of parchment and you 
can see where it is at the moment, who's doing what with it, and what data is being collected from it. And if you want to participate in image any of this material, you can. Um, so we're trying to understand the process of the, the fleece and the link between the fleece and the parchment. The next thing that happens, it goes to the lime yard. Um, and what we see here is that the duration of time in the lime yard impacts upon the quality of the protein. The longer it's in lime, the more damaged the protein is. And so this is a measurement that comes out of proteomics. So when you analyze that, you can plot against time what we call a parchment quality index. The lower these numbers are, the longer it's been in lime. And you can see with 95% confidence, for most of parchment production, it's very, very consistent. And then you have a decline that begins in the 15th century. And it seems to coincide with the fall in the price of paper relative to parchment. But my colleague at Cambridge, Orietta de Rolt, has argued, when she saw this graph, said, you've got completely wrong interpretation, Matthew. This is much more to do with increased literacy and just a, a demand for media to write upon. But we need that conversation between historians um, and scientists to understand why these changes are occurring. And again, we see a second blip during the Napoleonic War. What's causing that? My suspicion is that's it's derived for improvement and actually growing fatty sheep. Um, and the next thing what we're going to do is we're going to sort out the quality of the pelts, how good or how bad they are. And here we can look at the quality of the skin. So Annalise Benoit, who's a veterinarian, has now got really interested in looking at documentary sources of major moraines and disease events and then trying to relate those to the pathologies on the skin. So we're going to see if we can start to link together the quality of the parchment, particularly things, things like manicourt rolls, with known moraine events. And then you start looking at the, the frame itself, and this is being scraped with the actions of the frame. And so what he has been doing, he's been imaging using uh, transmitted light, and all parchments should always be imaged in transmitted light. Who cares about the text? We need to see the biological structures. <laughs> and you can see here how you can see the scrape marks on the lunellum, and what he's doing is joining those together. We've been running a bit of software to try and help assemble these, these parchments back into skins. And when they're assembled into skins, we can then do, say, measurements on the whole animal and work out how, how large the animal, which is one of the reasons we know that these animals are killed at six to eight weeks in the case of calf. And then, if you want to go further, this is an RTI image. Um, this is, sorry, I shouldn't call it RTI, sorry about that, Mark, but this imaging but with, with, with the dome. And what we're hoping to see here is, can we start to see the scrape marks on the parchment? Can we see the marks of the lunellum? And simply have a series of parchment documents in a codex, they're probably being produced by similar parchment makers, can we actually track the parchment makers themselves in the style of the scrape marks and then nicks and breaks on the lunellum? This is what areas you would like to be able to do. Then we come on to use, and you're going to really intriguing questions about how parchment is being made, how it's being used. Here we have Christ, uh, Canterbury, we have Christchurch, the cathedral, scriptorium, and outside the walls of the city, we have um, St. Augustine's Priory. I have to go over there. So St. Augustine's is here. Do they make parchment differently? And so one of the things that has already been noted is that at St. Augustine's, they don't use a so-called continental style of uh, skin to uh, hair to hair, flesh to flesh, that they do in Christchurch. It, um, in Christchurch, it comes out very, very rapidly. Everyone adopts the same style. At St. Augustine's, things are done differently. So we looked at one book so far, and it's an amazing book. This book has five species in it. This is a book in its original binding. Um, and the binding is in roe deer, which is itself fascinating with some red deer um, and fallow deer leather strap. You can't tell the difference. But when you look at the structure of the book, it's just incredible. It's made of a mixture of calf and sheep. And if you look at the structure of it, um, choir four is different in folding to the first three choirs and all subsequent choirs, where we have a mixture of calf and sheep. But what that must to tell me is that you couldn't at the time tell the difference between the two. They didn't look visually that different. So that's why this one has been misfolded and the scribe has happily started writing on an outer folia of sheep and not calf. And then, as you go along, you'll notice it goes to more and more calf, which makes no sense. So you break this rule, but the rule breaks not long before the main scribe of the text changes. And if you think that calf is, at this time, we believe, worth viewed as being much better material than sheep, is that good scribe taking the best material? So the second scribe, poor old scribe, has much less good material to work on. The answer is yes, because you've made the quality of parchment, it actually goes down and down and down and down. 
So there's been a selection there, and I suspect that it's at this point the scribe realized he couldn't complete the document, so he just uses up all the good stuff. <laughs> and then the curious other thing is, here we see a goat. It almost seems that it's half of a goat. Oh, but I should also say that each of these is one animal, one animal, so that in, in, these, in these first two uh, choirs, you see one calf and one sheep, and they're killing animals as they go. So this is really implying they're really limited in the amount of material they have. To see a goat is really bizarre, because why? We almost never see goats in British parchment. And the other thing that um, a biblical scholar pointed out, this is the Gospel of Luke, it's a gloss Gospel of Luke, and there's only one mention of goat in the Gospel of Luke, and it's the story of the prodigal son, and it's on that choir. <laughs> so is that a tribal joke? <laughs> and then the other side of this is, can we link this even to the individual? And so... This is an example where we actually have no documents from this particular scriptorium, but this was a nun who had been interested in analysing the, the, the proteomics in the mouth, and in this case, there's evidence of lapis lazuli. This is not part of this team, this is another team that I was involved with. But you know, it's really quite a the thought you can start to link an individual back to a document, then look at the osteobiography of the individual, and then, and of course, in this case, they're making the point that, that you know, women were probably illustrators too. Um, and then you start looking at the bindings, and what we see is we see a lot of uh, deer skin, which is kind of intriguing because this is a royal animal and had to get royal prerogative to use it. Um, and deer turns up, as I mentioned, in that book in Christchurch, just slightly later. But then we start looking at Cistercian documents, and they made a seal skin. And they made a seal skin. Apparently, at this time in France, there's no world for seal skin. They're made from seal skin. And more extraordinary than that, these are not just your common or garden, well, they are your common or garden um, uh, gray seal. But they're not common garden because they're actually coming from Norway, and there's one harp seal. Harp seals are only found in, in the High Arctic. It's almost certainly coming, I think, from West Greenland, but we don't actually know where it's coming from yet. So these are really exotic materials being used in the Cistercian monasteries, and it's not just in the foundational monastery Clairvaux, it's being used everywhere. So are they learning this technique of, of using seal skin? Why are they choosing seal skin? What is the purpose behind that? But what this thing is just turning out now for proteins. And then what about the use of animal <laughs> So if you have a favoured Bible and you're constantly accessing it and kissing it, um, what is it going to tell you about the sort of record that's left behind? So this is the York Gospels, and here we have a page with heavy conservation intervention, and it has a lot of human DNA in it. Look, lots of human DNA. <laughs> but one other page also has lots of DNA in it, and it's the oath page. It is the page which is most physically interacted with on that document. And then you look at the pattern of DNA damage, and the DNA damage, which is, I can't go into detail, this says it's old DNA. So this is not young DNA, this is old DNA. So this looks like the DNA of the interaction with the document, except for this case, which is conservation intervention. And when you actually then look at the bacteria on those documents, you can clearly see the piece with heavy conservation intervention. And what's interesting about that one, it has propionic and acne on it, but this is a skin bacteria from humans. You can see the interaction with the skin. The rest of the bacteria are rather more intriguing, and we can see interesting things between, we have some additional, this is the later 14th century material added to the same um, codex, which has a different microbial pattern from these uh, parts of the document, which, is, which are from the original uh, 10th century, and this is the heavy conservation intervention. These are control samples from the archive of legal documents. So, that, so maybe the microbial population is telling us something about the use history, the storage history, who knows what history the, the bugs are going to be telling us. And then when you actually look at the bugs associated with humans, you can compare the bacteria with, say, bacteria from gut, bacteria from um, uh, saliva, bacteria from nose and skin. And you can see it's mainly nose and skin bacteria. And you can see by the, the plots that the, the, the difference in levels of interaction, the one which has the strongest signal, is the one which has been conservation intervention, so that's people handling it. But the one which is the one that's been kissed has actually a more generic microbiome. So we can, we can start asking questions about the microbiome and the interaction. So the challenge we then have, this is a picture of the Bogdan meeting, it's how we actually bring these different cultures together. How we bring together the conservation scientists, the code ecologists, um, and, and the conservators. How do we bring those three cultures together? And what we're hoping to do is have a meeting in, in the Folger in late May to actually get a small group of people together to actually start really challenging these questions. And then there's a the question of bees. Why bees? Well, because recently in the lab, we analysed a piece of chewing gum. 
very old chewing gum. Uh, it's the Stone Age chewing gum. But that piece of chewing gum, by dissolving the chewing gum away, we were able to recover the genome of a girl with blue eyes, dark hair, swarthy skin, who'd eaten hazelnuts, mallard duck, and eel, and had a hunter-gatherer genome, despite the fact she was living alongside Neolithic farming populations. So trapped inside the chewing gum is a story of the life history of an individual. So we thought, well, there's huge numbers uh, in the portable antiquity record of these seal, seal matrices. Uh, and what we have uh, a student in the new project who's been working on these um, up in Lincoln. And if you here's an image of these, these seals being used. And when we image those with 3D, uh, CT imaging, what well, you see this weird kind of phyllo pasty structure. And the team the archives uh, project, uh, sorry, sorry the, the imprint project, I mean, I think it's just because they've been fitting, handled, and, 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 and manipulated. And so what we're hoping is that that manipulation, that interaction with these objects, is going to entrap, in the same way as the chewing gum entrapped, uh, DNA of individuals. And the hope then is we can use not only the parchment document to look at cows, sheep, and goat, but we can look at the individuals with human DNA in the seal, and we can start looking at one of the two domesticated insect species. So there's another domesticate. We've looked at silk. Silk doesn't look very good. There's not much genomic information left in silk. But beeswax is looking very promising. And so what can we do with beeswax? Well, we can look at the bee, the bee pathogen, the plants they've been consuming, the dietary singles, signals from the lipids, um, and the pollen. So what we're going to try and do and develop over the course of the next four years is an extraction system which gets out all of those different components. And this is one example. This is a commercially available protocol. But the idea is that we're being very much influenced by, uh, the, um, by, by studies of painting, where you really manage to extract everything out of these tiny pieces of painting. Whereas in archaeology, we've generally gone along, grabbed a bone and grabbed, taken it for DNA, taken it for proteomics, and not worked together. Um, and so the idea that you could potentially look at seals from known people linked to known interactions with other individuals. And so we're going to be targeting, we hope, things like seals from women um, so that we can look for, hopefully, presence of no Y chromosome, implying it's that woman who probably has interacted with that seal document. And that gives, gives you the kind of idea that, uh, and we're going to work in different parts of the world because we're interested in trade the Hanseatic League and also more lo local production. Uh, and then again, you can look, ask questions about trade. The Hanseatic League really expands its, its beeswax production uh, um, following, the, following treaties. And so you can start thinking about the whole dynamics of medieval world and what, how these objects are moving around. And so we're working a whole bunch of other projects that are working in, in different areas. And what we're hoping to do is to look at uh, Hanseatic trade, so east-west, and then north-south with trade with North Africa. So that's what we're hoping to do. And ultimately, would it be possible you have a seal from a village deposited on the ground? You have a document about that individual. We have information about that person. We know where they were buried. We then go to that medieval graveyard and dig up the individuals. Can we actually start to link back documents to skeletons? I don't know, but maybe it's possible. And then the other thing to mention, of course, is... If we're interacting with beeswax, it's not just seals. It's skulls. We heard about it today. And so this is an exa extraordinary example where the pollen, this is the beeswax was down to pollen, so it's probably Southern Europe. It's more, more recently, it's been attributed to Leonardo, Leonardo. So if you wanted to get Leonardo's DNA, and there's a project at the moment trying to get it from paper, I would go to sculpture. I would go to the original models. And so, yeah, so if you're going to do this crazy genome, do it from the beeswax. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Do we have any questions from the audience? All right, I have a comment that uh, I'd like to make. I think that um, your research is absolutely the uh, for the interdependency of the disciplines. Precisely. This amazing data that you're pulling up and the interpretation is not something that a scientist do. No, so. Do that book object, we, hadn't, we saw that structure, we had no idea what it meant. And it's only by having a, a paleographer could recognize the different scribal styles than having a biblical scholar 
you know, and, and actually I've also had a book by I mean, that, but all these two different people coming together, without them, you could never, well, we still can't explain it, but we're getting better at ideas into how we might understand it. It's just fascinating. And the concept of women as illustrators, I was interested yeah. in um, why certain things get written down and other things show up in the archaeological records. Yes, but well, you saw that. I mean, you, you saw that with the, the, the day on doomsday. It's really strange how archaeologists will tell you they do not kill young calves. Uh, and because we, do, we don't see their bones, and that's the archaeological evidence. So you think, well, look, just look in the libraries. They're everywhere. These are six to eight week old animals. They're tiny, tiny animals. And they're, they're, I don't understand why they're not being picked up in the archaeological record. I mean, in places like Canada, it looks like every single calf that's being produced is, is going into biblical Bible production. I don't know if it is, but, but they, they really have this massive demand for material at certain times. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised about that discontinuity. And it's actually quite alarming in a way. And we don't, we don't fully understand the taphonic history of why that happens. I have a question about the search of analyzing the wax. Mm -hmm. Does heat treatment affect the results that you can get? And yes, I know. So the, the, the great thing about those environments, we've been looking, also been looking at the Brea tar pits as well with tar, is, I mean, the Brea tar pits, they boil the, 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 the bones in in kerosene at 380 degrees centigrade. Because there's no water present, the proteins are preserved. So it's the absence of water which is critical. So if you, if you heat other beeswax, and there's a lot of water associated with them, and again, um, trying to understand that relationship, you know, to what extent there's actually water entrapped as you, as you manipulate the wax. And so Laura Angelova has been working on this at the National Archive, and she thinks you know, they're dropping the wax into hot water and they're manipulating it so that that layered structure, that phyllo pastry structure, is actually layers of water getting entrapped and entrained within the wax as you, as you fold it. So that could cause problems if that water is there with the DNA and the proteins and it's in a sealed, closed system. There'll be a lot of water there, and that could be highly damaging. But the answer is that yeah, we don't know yet. We don't know. I was more thinking in terms of what maybe Glenn will talk about, but in terms of like fine portraits and these endless discussions about Punic wax and whether the wax has been heated or not. Oh, well, but you, yes, I mean, certain, one of the things we want to yeah. do is, um, you, 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 of course, you can tell whether the beeswax has been heated or not by looking at. The, the degradation patterns in it. So what I didn't mention, what we are now trying to do is, is get re individual radiocarbon dates out of the lipids and deuterium isotopes for, for climbing out of the lipids. So in terms of authentication, I think there's a lot of information that's going to come out of that. But in terms of heating, I'm not concerned because in the absence of water, the, if, as long as the biomolecules are, are still there and have not been completely rendered out by the process of production, I'm confident they will be, still be present and readable. Because, again, we don't read intact molecules, we read fragments. Modern genetic scientists have to shear their DNA because the, in, the machines can't sequence long pieces. The Punic wax has been thoughtfully sheared for us by the process manufacturer. Mm -hmm. manufacturer. Yes? Um, for sampling from the wax objects, is it a similarly... No, it's horribly destructive, which is why I'm buying stuff on eBay at the moment, <laughs> so that I can destroy my own. Um, no, one of the things we want to try and do is, and, and if you read the paper on the gums, that chewing gum piece, we used a ridiculously, shamefully large amount because it was the first uh, attempt. Now what we're trying to do, that's the idea of we have to be destructive with the wax. If, if you know anything about wax in archives, there's these drawers with these envelopes full of just fragments which are poorly uh, attributed now. So we're hoping to use that material first and then essentially try and get as <coughs> everything we can out of the same tiny piece. That's our goal. We know we have to destroy the wax. So rather than like with the parchment, we're using an electrostatic approach, we are going to try and be, get the maximum, rather than like an art, art history with a core of a piece of paint. paint. So does that mean that you'll need to destroy a substantial amount of the Leonardo to find... Well, I mean, clearly enough was destroyed to get the pollen analysis. That must have been a lot of wax to get that much pollen to get the identification of where the material came from. So, yeah, it will be a small amount, but it will be much larger than you're happy with. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a purely thought experiment. But it just makes the point. I mean, we're, I'm more interested. I, I, I have yet to see the value of getting the, the genome of a famous individual other than perhaps for authentication purposes. I mean, they're arguing they, they want to understand things like visual acuity. But um, no, for me, I'm more interested in the, the boring histories of medieval peoples who hadn't 
the ability to write and, and form their own signatures, so we're using these wax seals. Mm. That's, okay. Well, please join me in thanking Matthew again.